Hi, this is Alex. In this video, I'm going to be painting uh, some plums and a bowl jar. This is a photograph for reference in case you would like to follow along. And I'd like to say also that this video is available in Russian on my channel, so check that out if you speak Russian or if you don't. Alright, so let's get into it. I'm going to start by mixing some burnt umber with some ultramarine blue and I'm using uh, some pure refined linseed oil as my medium. Some people have asked me about my mediums. Um, ideally you would use uh, a mixture of linseed oil, Damar varnish and turpentine. However, that does create some fumes. So if you live in a, you know, in an apartment or a place where you want to avoid fumes, you can just use pure linseed oil and it still works pretty well. And uh, today I'm painting on a tinted surface, with a tinted uh, panel. And um, what I did is I just, uh, from my one of my previous paintings, I scraped up all the paint that was left on my, on my palette and I just uh, rub it into a, a white panel just to kind of give it a little bit of color and um, I do prefer painting on a tinted pan uh, panel because it just makes things a little bit easier and it sort of gives me a base and doesn't force me to cover all of the you know all of the areas of the painting if there's a little bit of a little gap here or there it's not quite as obvious as when you're painting on white. So I'm starting by just kind of blocking in the, the overall shapes of the plums and the jar and kind of finding where they are in the composition and at this point you want to keep things pretty loose uh, without getting into too much detail and if something doesn't feel quite right you can erase it and start over it's pretty it's a pretty forgiving stage but it is important to get things defined well in this stage uh, and not move forward until you kind of found your composition at least uh, as for me I feel like this is pretty good there's enough space on left and right of the of the objects enough space top and bottom and things are feeling pretty well now, to be fair, the perspective of the jar isn't quite worked out, but it's fairly straight on, so I'm not going to worry about it too much until I get into the, you know, the details of painting the glass itself. For now, I think it'll do. I'm just going to quickly rough in the, the lettering on the jar. It says ball just to kind of give myself a reference point so point of where it is and this top part of the jar is probably the most complicated because it's got um, it's got the thread for for the lid and so it, it's going to be a challenge to to paint all those details and kind of make it look convincing this is the way the light's going to reflect off of everything. I will cross that bridge when we get to it. I'm also kind of giving a, a couple of indications here and there of where is the line between light and shadow. And here's a photo again just to kind of get a sense of how I'm coming along. All right, so that's just about it for the initial sketch. Now I'm going to go into just kind of filling in the, all the areas of color. So I'm going to start with the background color. And I'm using, again, uh, some ultramarine blue, some uh, burnt umber. And I'm also adding a little white. And I'm using a palette knife to 
to mix up um, kind of a decent amount just so I don't run out along the way. I'm also adding a little bit of uh, um, yellow ochre to the mix to warm up the color a little bit as well. Just kind of going back and forth and trying to find the, the right tone. And uh, this is just going to be kind of a in-between color. It's not going to be the lightest or the darkest, just sort of a base, base color that I can then adjust using my brush to make darker and lighter colors. So I'm going to use a pretty, uh, pretty big bristle brush and just roughly cover the background. I'm using uh, some um, linseed oil also to thin the paint down so that it goes on a little bit easier. And uh, you can probably see that because I have a tinted background it's a little bit more forgiving and I don't have to get you know I don't have to worry about the white showing through the color as much and just another benefit so the first thing I want to do is just get get things pretty much covered with paint and um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, a lot of art happening at that point. It's more just like getting roughly the colors filled in, and then once that happens, then you can kind of go into some details and make a little magic start to happen. So I'm uh, darkening this color a little bit using some uh, more ultramarine blue and burnt umber. Uh, to create that shadow behind the jar. And because the the jar is transparent, you know that space between the plums pretty much takes on the color of the background. And it's still useful for me to have those lines there to remind me of the shape of it, but you can pretty much see through the jar, so the color doesn't change that much as it goes through the jar through the glass. And on the left here, there's a little bit more light because I have a I have a lamp set up on the left side, upper left. So that side has a little catches a little bit more light. So I'm adding a little bit more white to the mixture, which kind of makes the color a little bit cooler as well. And as I'm painting, I'm trying to overpaint the background a little bit over the the foreground element. So this way I don't have too much gaps between my foreground and background. I can always go, when I paint with the plums, it's always better to go a little bit over the, the background color rather than having to struggle to kind of butt right up against it. So next I'm going to work on the surface which is a, kind of an orangish wood color. So I'm uh, getting a little bit of uh, yellow ochre and uh, this yellow ochre is pretty old so I'm kind of getting down to the end of a very large tube and 
it's gotten pretty stiff so whenever I use it I have to kind of cut it with some linseed oil to make it workable otherwise it's just too stiff to work so I'm gonna do that first get a little bit of linseed oil mix that into the yellow ochre and then I'm adding some burnt sienna which is a very kind of reddish color Okay, and uh, now I'm going to uh, bring in a little bit of white, titanium white to brighten things up. And again, just like with the background color, right now I'm just looking for a general middle tone that I can kind of block in the color with. And then I'll go in and you know create some nuances between the different areas. This is the kind of the light part of the wood. And I've also added a little bit of uh, cadmium yellow to it. So now I'm going to go in with uh, another uh, wide bristle brush and just uh, roughly block that in as well. And same thing here. I'm, uh, going a little bit over the edges of the objects but also kind of being careful not to go into the areas that are going to be shadows which probably should have painted first but because I have this um, this nice background color that's already dark it's almost the color of my shadows so I'm just going to bring in some uh, burnt umber and with some linseed oil and then a little bit of, uh, of yellow ochre and burnt sienna to lighten that up and to give it a little more of a yellow reddish color and I'll use that for my shadows. And it's probably a little bit dark, but I'm not too worried about making it exact just yet. So I'm just going to bring in some of the color that I use for my for my light color and mix that into my shadow color to brighten it. And the shadow is going to get a little bit lighter as it travels further away from the object too. And the other thing that's going to happen is the edge of the shadow is going to get softer also, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Not until I have the, the light part filled in, so then I can just blend those two together. And uh, the shadow of this um, foreground plum actually travels right through the glass, and you can see it on the surface of the table underneath the jar. So that's going to be kind of an interesting little bit to paint. So for now I'm just kind of blocking that in. And even though the glass is transparent, right at the very bottom, right at the edge between the glass and the table, there's a little bit of a dark kind of line that sort of helps to separate it from the from the surface. Okay, so now I'm just gonna go in and Wherever I see the light color popping through, I'm going to go ahead and bring that in. And then this is the time to kind of feather out the shadow a little bit as it travels away from the, from the source. And there's a lot more nuance and detail in this, in the surface that I'm not really bothering with right now. I'm just kind of um, blocking in the overall kind of light and shadow and just like with the uh, the surface <coughs> the background with the gray uh, this area at the front has a little bit uh, more light than and it kind of gets darker as it travels across to the right so putting in a couple of little variations while I have the paint on my brush 
but nowhere near the amount of detail that I would that I would ha that I would want in the end. So now I'm going to work on the plums, which is the last thing that's left um, unpainted on this board. And I'm starting with the darkest darks, and uh, for that I'm just using a little bit of alizarin crimson, a little bit of uh, ultramarine blue. And for the plums, it's going to be important to kind of work, have a little bit of a plan and work really from darks to lights because uh, there's a this kind of uh, white bloom that's on the plums kind of white purplish bloom and the only really effective way to paint it is to have a good base color that you kind of see like if you were to wipe off the bloom you would have that color you if you can kind of polish those plums you'll have this reddish purplish color so I'll have that on the painted on the plums first and then go over that with the color of the bloom which is kind of a white gray kind of purplish color and um, the darks on these uh, plums are for the most part they're in the shadows but you can also see a lot of kind of really dark darks um, near where the stem is connected as you can see so I'm putting those in now and then uh, next I'll take a the color of the, the lighted parts um, which is going to be kind of an orangish color uh, and I'm just using some uh, again a lizard crimson uh, some white and some uh, cad yellow uh, and this is probably I'm kind of I'm gonna just temper it down a little bit with uh, with yellow ochre because it's not so bright, and it's probably still a little bright, but um, I'll be able to kind of uh, adjust it as I go along. And yeah, there's a there's a few places where you can see this color shining through the bloom, and so I'm just blocking that in. I'm gonna uh, darken the color with a little bit more red, and uh, that's gonna create my middle tone between those really intense bright lights and my shadow colors. And this color is. Uh, Definitely much much more intense than what I'm seeing on the plums, but that's kind of intentional. I wanted to I wanted to have some really bright color shining through the the color of the bloom that I'm going to apply on later on. So the that the color of the bloom, kind of the grays, are going to really push this bright color down with only a little bit of it shining through. So. It's all going to work out in the end. And I'm also trying to kind of stay, pay attention to where, uh, where is the edge between light and shadow as I'm doing this as well. So it's a little tricky when you have so much kind of color variation across the surface of an object to pay attention to also what are, what are the lights and darks, especially on a, on a shiny object like the, like the plums. So I'm just kind of paying some vague attention to it. So now I'm mixing up the color for the bloom. And the bloom is the, the kind of uh, little film that goes over the, that's over the plums that gets rubbed off very easily if you handle it or if you wash it. So uh, for that, I'm using a little bit of the gray that I had for the background color. Um, I'm uh, adding to it some ultramarine blue, some white, and some alizarin crimson to create kind of a light grayish purple. And I have to be kind of judicious with this color because uh, since it has a lot of white in it, it does have a lot of uh, covering power. So it'll easily 
kind of overtake any color that it goes over and it might be a, a bit of a challenge to paint any darker colors on top of that color. So as I'm going along, um, making little adjustments, adding a little bit of white here or there, if I see that color reflected in the subject, or adding some ultramarine blue uh, to make it a little bit more blue um, as I see it. And um, I'm being kind of careful. Uh, this plum in the middle of the jar is mostly covered in bloom. It's mostly gray and white, but the rest of them have um, a bit of a balance between <coughs> between the the sort of the underneath color, which is that bright um, reddish orange, and the bloom itself. So can't really go back once you put that that light blue color it's gonna be hard to go back to a to a darker purplish color so this foreground uh, plum is beginning to kind of come into focus And really, that's just because I've covered the entire surface. Uh, in reality, it's, uh, it doesn't look quite like that. It probably needs a lot more uh, patches of bloom, as you can see. But just by having sort of the entire surface of it covered, it's already beginning to look kind of nice and real. And you can see by comparing to the photograph, just how much more dull and less saturated the plums are in real life. But it's always easier to go more dull than to go from dull to bright, uh, especially when working with oil paint. So I'm just going to dull them down gradually and slowly. And so as I'm applying these uh, kind of brush strokes of bluish, grayish, purplish color, I'm just sort of looking at the subject and trying to find uh, where they appear. Um, more or less just copying. And as I'm going over this intense color, my brush picks up some of that background color, so I make sure to go back in and load up the brush with the brush paint. And uh, this bloom is also very helpful for defining the edges uh, because as the shape of the plum turns, you see much more of the bloom because it's kind of foreshortened, and so that helps define that almost like a white outline around the plums. And as I'm adding more and more bloom to this, I think it's looking better and better. Getting closer and closer to what I want it to look like. And it does change as it travels across the, the surface. It changes both with the light and there's variations in the color uh, of that, that bluish, grayish, purplish color. So I'm constantly adjusting it a little bit. But I'm using that base color as my starting point. And just slowly building it up over my background color. And you can probably see why 
it's so important with something like this to really start with that solid background color before you begin to add the uh, add these details because now if I wanted to go like if I wanted to work with just those two colors the the light color and the red color it would be really difficult to kind of go between between those and as I'm painting I'm also using that that this light color to help define the shape of the plum like on the bottom of this one that I'm painting now there's a little bit of a split uh, that helps identify that part of it so now what I'm gonna do is uh, uh, create a, a much brighter version of this color and just put in the the highlight on this pair on this plum uh, because it really is standing out usually I would wait until the very end but in this case it just kind of sort of needed to have it there in order to have everything else around it flow so now this pair uh, plum I don't know why I keep calling them pears this plum at the bottom of this jar uh, is not quite as bright so I'm using some of my shadow color to dim it down and at the same time establishing a little bit more of the the light and shadow play on the surface and then so yeah so this is a, a color that's from the same family but with a little bit more white uh, which is basically the color of my the highlight of the pair and the same a little bit of that same color lives in the in the other pair in the other plum as well and the plum on top probably needs the most attention right now so I'm gonna establish its uh, its shadow a little bit more uh, with that same mixture or variation of the mixture that I had for my uh, for my shadow color which is a little bit of crimson some ultramarine blue and probably a little bit of uh, burnt umber as well so now I have more or less light and shadow defined on all the plums and I'm just kind of pushing things forward and backwards a little bit using the light to bring out the light part of the, sh the, the plum and the dark to kind of push back the darks a little bit more now I'm just adding some touches of bloom on this plum being again very careful and judicious with it and this particular one actually has a seam that runs the other way so that line that I made on the right side of the plum is not quite right so I'm gonna try to define it a little bit better on going along this way and uh, I can use the background color to help define the drawing of that of the outside of the plum and touch up some of the other ones while I'm at it when you have a object on kind of a neutral gray background and the the lighted side is brighter than uh, the background and the, the shadow side is darker in the background that sort of automatically creates an illusion of space between the object and the background color so now I'm going to work a little bit on the shadow side of the plums and uh, uh, what I'm doing now is adding a little bit of reflected light in the shadow and the reflected light is always going to be uh, brighter when uh, if the object is closer to the surface so the plums that are lower are going to have brighter reflected light than the ones that are 
uh, kind of stacked on top of each other. And then um, here also I'm just uh, defining a little bit of the darks. Sort of what I said is going to be kind of difficult to do when, when you have the white. And you can kind of see that instead of uh, that color going on sort of nice, rich, and dark, it immediately becomes lighter and more bluish, purplish, which in some places works okay. And uh, the bloom that's uh, in the highlight is also present in the shadows, but there it's much darker. So I'm uh, just mixing that with a little bit of my gray color. Um, just to darken it up so that uh, reflects that there's no light hitting it directly. And sometimes you need to just kind of apply it onto the surface to see if it's right and then adjust from there. The lighting on your palette is not always the same as that on your painting and also you don't get the benefit of seeing kind of the uh, the colors that next to the the color that you're mixing. So sometimes that's all you need to do is just bring it onto the painting and see what it feels like. It's always easy to go back and adjust and readjust as long as you don't go overboard with the amount of paint that you put on. So now that the plums are more or less done, the background is filled in, the table is filled in, now I'm going to work on the jar itself, the glass. That's the last thing that's sort of completely unfinished here. And I'm going to start by, um, as you should always start, you know, with going from darks to lights. So I'm going to work on the places where you can see the kind of the dark parts where the glass kind of turns away from you. You begin to see it sort of affect the background and kind of darkening the background. So in this case, I'm just using the background color and just uh, just making it a little bit darker than the background. And this is really the time to look at the overall shape of the uh, of the of the object and really define its its drawing. Because over the course of the painting, I've kind of mushed some of the some of the edges and kind of blurred things a little bit. So it sort of disappeared into the background a little bit. So now we'll kind of work on the mouth of the jar. Like the places that, where the perspective is visible are the more, most important ones. So the, the mouth of the jar and the base of the jar. And also where the, the lid gets screwed on. That's, there's a lot of uh, intricate detail there that betrays the perspective. So if you, Kind of get those things wrong, then it'll be that those are the places where it'll be visible. And uh, I really have to be judicious about how much dark I use. If you look at the photo, you can see that there's only very a few very few places where the jar is actually darker than the background. For the most part, it's a little bit lighter and or just completely transparent and invisible so i definitely don't want to go too far and make things too dark because then it's not going to look right it's not going to look real and i'm going to define the bottom a little bit and for that i need the the table color to kind of uh, shape it a little bit and outline it. There's a, a little bit of light that kind of falls right inside of the jar and it's almost underneath that that bottom plum. And uh, so I want to hit that. And then also the bottom of the jar where the glass is the thickest, um, there's a, a bit of green that's visible when you're looking right through the glass. So I definitely want to capture that because it's a nice little detail. So I'm just using some um, 
cad yellow, some uh, chromium green, and uh, some white to make that color. And in order for that color to really shine, it needs to be sort of surrounded by dark. So there's a shadow that's right underneath the jar, and then there's a, a bit of a dark that goes above it as well. And um, I'm gonna also sort of de define that cast shadow from this front plum. And uh, also, while I have this color, add a little bit of uh, reflection on a jar that's being um, that's being reflected off of the table. So that's just that same table color, but because I'm putting it over this darker color, it gets a little bit diluted and washed out. So it becomes a little bit more realistic. So that was a fun little detour, but uh, let's get back to work and continue to refine the drawing of the of the jar using that same darker gray color. And it may not look like much what I'm doing right now, but it's sort of it's sort of important to establish where things are even if it might not be very easily visible on video those strokes are really helpful for me to um, as, a, as a sort of a reminder of where things are I'm also seeing that the jar appears to be darker on the left side of the plums than a little bit lighter on the right side so making a note of that as well. And uh, I'm seeing also the, the back of that oval of the bottom of the jar, which helps reestablish its shape too, and the perspective. So next I'm gonna mix up a uh, lighter version of the background color and further use that to uh, refine the shape of the jar as well. So I'm going to put some of that um, on the on the right side of the of the plums to help um, to help uh, define kind of that that space, the feeling of space between the background and the pl and the plums, and um, also to um, to help refine that right edge of the jar, because the background behind the jar is uh, up there is a little bit lighter, so I want to make a note of that with the paint. And I want it to feel like it's the same. It's the same color, kind of going across from the left of the jar to the right of the jar. So I want to make sure that uh, the part that has the highlight is uh, a similar uh, value um, as the on the left and right. So next, uh, I think it's time to draw some reflections on the jar. So I'm using a lighter gray. And um, I'm basically starting with the same gray color that I had and uh, just lightening up with some, uh, some titanium white, adding a little bit more, you know, adjusting the, the color of it with uh, some blue and some uh, burnt umber uh, until I find something that looks sort of like what I see in the, in the subject. And uh, just kind of going back and forth, a little bit of uh, yellow to kind of green it up. So this is, these are not uh, uh, highlights. These are really just reflections of light on the periphery of the jar. So just so you can see for reference on the right, 
these uh, reflections, they're not right on the edge of the jar. They're kind of, uh, they're a little bit inward, so that's where I'm trying to put them. And because this color is, uh, has a lot of weight in it, it does have a lot of hiding power. So if I go over the background, it tends to, um, it tends to go cover whatever is underneath it pretty well. But I can always add a little bit more, uh, go back in and I, I need to reload the brush once in a while as well. So, you know, as you can see, even just from those two lines, that jar is already beginning to look um, a lot more like glass. And that's really all there is to painting glasses. You just kind of need to sort of copy where the light falls and how it reflects off of the off of the glass. And so that's really all I'm doing. There's not really any specific trick to it. And the more details you put in, the more it'll look like uh, like glass. One thing to note is that the glass will reflect whatever is in your room. So, you know, when you're setting up your still life, you want to be kind of mindful of that because if you have a lot of uh, a lot of things in your room that are bright, those will be reflected in the glass. So you'll have you'll have kind of more more work for you. Like for example, for me, I have a the still life is sitting on top of a of a white kind of a table. So there's a white table and then a, a wooden board on top of that. So the glass is picking up some of the wooden board, but it's also picking up some of the white that's not in the frame. But in either case, if you just stick to copying what you see and you know, what, what I mean by what you see is if you copy kind of the big shapes that you see reflected in light in the glass, then you should be okay and you'll get something that looks like glass. And then on these, uh, on this uh, mouth of the jar where there's the, the, tr the, the threads, we're seeing a little bit of the reflection of the table as well because the there's much more of an angle to the glass there. And at this point, I'm still not um, not adding any really bright highlights yet. Um, those will come at the very end. And the, the, the real bright highlights are going to be almost pure white. It can be tempting to um, to switch to a much smaller brush once you're working on these uh, really kind of fine detailed areas but I tend to find that if I switch to a much smaller brush like a sable brush I wind up um, when I'm kind of committing to a certain amount of detail and you sort of become responsible for the same level of detail across the entire painting so if you can stick to a bigger brush then you you tend to kind of bring the painting up to a certain level of detail as a whole. So now I'm just uh, uh, putting in the highlights on the sign of the jar that says ball. It's a ball jar. And uh, it, it can be tempting to just go in there and just completely write that, that sign in one color. Like let's say you pick up a, um, that darker color and just write it out, uh, but that's not how you can see, how you see it. So when you look at it, try to see what parts are shining, what parts are are not, and you'll notice that there is not really any dark there at all. It's really just just whatever glare gets picked up by the light. So you know it's okay to do give just an indication of it and let the viewer's eye fill in the rest. It's uh, actually better not to have any writing in your painting, I think. Because like when you have some writing, like on a label, 
it forces a different kind of attention from the user. And you want a certain kind of homogeneous amount of attention from the user, from the, the viewer across your painting. You don't want to have points on the painting where the viewer has to stop and pay additional attention to it. So like if you have, if I spelled that ball there, that would become a sticking point on the, on the, on the painting. And, you know, a user would not, or not a user, a viewer would not be able to necessarily appreciate the rest of the parts of the painting. And it would kind of break away from the harmony of the painting as a whole. So the way I have it now is just a little bit of indications. You know, you can, you get the idea that's writing, but your eye doesn't stop on those areas and doesn't get stuck. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, so I'm working on the mouth of the jar, which is probably the most complicated part of this painting. But I don't want to overwork it too much. Again, just like with the rest of it, I'm just giving indications of what, what's there. You can see from taking a closer look at it that there's a there's, there are two sort of lines that go um, across the mouth. And they're not a simple line. It's not just, you know, dark on the bottom, light on top. It's, there's a lot of variation and complexity in it. So you want to kind of be respectful of that and, and not oversimplify. So now comes the exciting part. This is... Uh, when you put the highlights on the painting. To me, this is one of the most fun parts of the process because things really begin to kind of literally shine once you do that. And it's the last thing that you do because, or one of the last things that you do, because that pure white is gonna be a, a hassle to fight with if you make a mistake and if, if you wanna work under it or next to it. So, I tend to do it as the as the very last thing. And I'm using a uh, a stick just to to steady my hand because when you're working on these kind of sort of finer details, you need a little something to to stabilize yourself. My hands are not as steady as they used to be. So these uh the the lettering has a, a variety in the brightnesses of reflections and so does the the, the mouth of the jar so and these uh, these bright highlights really do help to define the the shape and the volume of the of the glass jar as well there's one there's one set of highlights on the front front left of the jar and there's also another set of highlights on the back, on the other side. So anywhere the the surface sort of turns at a certain angle towards the light. And at this point I might as well add the final highlights onto the plums as well. And the highlights on the plums are not quite as bright as the ones on the glass because the plums are a little bit more matte they're not quite as shiny, so the shininess of the object really determines how bright the highlight is going to be. For example, that middle plum is not bright at all. I mean, not shiny at all. It's much more matte. It has a lot more of that bloom uh, on the surface, so the highlight on that one is going to be much more calm and subtle and that makes it look less shiny and if you put on a highlight and it feels feels wrong it feels too sort of stuck on like it's a little sticker then it's okay to go ahead and soften the edges around the, the highlight a little bit and that'll make it feel more natural so the table is looking a little bit amorphous, so I want to solidify it a little bit more by using a brighter yellow. 
and uh, all I did was just add a little bit more titanium white to my to the color that I already had on the palette and that sort of actually helps to bring a little bit of focus to the to the plums themselves as well by having that brightness right around them and then the other thing I'm going to do is uh, clarify the the really deep dark shadows so the the places where light can't can't really come in so right underneath the plums um, and that also helps to really ground the objects and make them feel like they're really sitting on that surface and that color is darker than than the cast shadow color because the cast shadow color still has some light being reflected into it but the very crack between the the plum and the table there the there's very little light that's coming in that's coming in there and uh, even though this color is almost black I mean pretty much black I'm not using black on my palette at all I'm kind of I mixed it myself I used uh, I use some ultramarine blue and some uh, alizarin crimson and those two colors gave me a pretty nice dark black color that still has a little bit of the uh, the family of the other objects so it still has some of the red in it and some of the blues in it um, so it's not a pure black uh, which I don't like to use in my paintings I really much prefer to mix my own blacks. This way I can control the the temperature of them. And I'm doing the same thing on the plums that are in the jar because where they're touching uh, gets really really dark and there's very little light coming into that crevice between the two plums. And um, what I'm doing now is uh, using a little bit of that purplish color to further define the edge of the plums. I mean at this point it's really just kind of instinctual whenever I see something that's bothering me a little bit I'll adjust it but everything has a, a purpose behind it to make things feel three-dimensional and volumetric. And uh, now that uh, painting is uh, almost finished, uh, I'm going to work, work on a couple of details. So one thing I want to do is I want to paint in the little stem of this uh, foreground plum. Uh, that'll add a nice little touch and I'm gonna paint this shadow first actually it has a pretty strong shadow that goes over the uh, over the surface of the plum and that shadow actually helps to define the shape of the plum itself and it's a since I'm painting over this very bright color that has a lot of white I have to use a pretty thick paint in order to cut through that. And then next I'll just paint in the stem with a little bit of a lighter brown. And it's looking pretty good already. But I'm going to also add a little bit of uh, a lighter color on the edge just to give it a little bit more volume. And I don't need to go into too much detail on that. Just that shadow and the light color already gives it a good, pretty good feel. So next I'm going to use a little bit of the dark, just a, just a hair in the, in the sign, just to give that some of those areas a little bit more volume. And it doesn't really need a lot, just a little touch here and there. And one thing that I haven't really addressed yet is the 
is the way that the plums get distorted as they um, as they pass through the glass, or sort of as the as the light from them passes through the glass. So there's a little bit of distortion happening where the glass is the thickest, so on the edges, on the left and right. Um, so I'm going to add that in a little bit. So along the edge, the, the there's a little bit of a distortion, and we can see a little bit of the plum through the edge of the glass. While I have this color, I'll adjust a little bit uh, the plum on top, and then through the the mouth of the jar, there's a little bit of distortion as well. And I'm kind of liking this. I think it adds a nice little detail that that's kind of important in this painting. It also makes the glass feel a little thicker. And uh, there's uh, the same thing happening on the right side as well in that shadow. A little bit more subtle, a little bit harder to see, but it's there. And uh, with that, I think we're going to call this one done. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you found it useful. Let me know in the comments your thoughts. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. I try to make these paintings um, as often as I can. They do take a little bit of time. Okay, until next time, bye-bye.